This is uh, Dr. Carlos Moreira, and I am an orthopedic surgeon. I'm working at Jackson Hospital, Mariana, Florida. And this is a reduction of a presentation that I gave to the um, medical executive committee uh, at my hospital on June 9th, 2000, 2020, uh, making the case for implementing a low-carbohydrate diet in an inpatient setting at a hospital. Um, I have no disclosures, no stocks in the healthcare or food companies. And my views here are just my views alone. They don't belong necessarily to the views of the U.S. Navy, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. So why this subject? Chronic disease makes up a number one cause of death and cause of morbidity in the United States. It uh, includes heart disease, including hypertension, uh, heart attack, stroke, cancer, uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, obesity, and various forms of arthritis. Uh, the problem of chronic disease uh, mainly can be rooted to insulin resistance. Um, it has been found out that 88% of the adults in the United States uh, have some sort of metabolic dysfunction or insulin resistance. And for those that are at least 60 years, of old, uh, years old or older, uh, the percentage is 98%, which is incredibly high. Now, this graph just shows the... Um, Increasing incidence of type 2 diabetes uh, in the United States uh, over the years, but uh, at this graph will be similar for so many other things like obesity, uh, for even things like autoimmune disorders. Um, so the key to all this is really to reverse the insulin resistance. Okay, this is insulin resistance is like the mothership here of the fleet, uh, where your smaller ships may be hypertension and diabetes, but really the mothership of all this is insulin resistance. Um, of note, it does correlate directly with visceral, visceral adipose tissue or visceral fat, which is the fat that surrounds the abdominal organs. Uh, it's a linear cor correlation. Uh, it hasn't been found out whether they, uh, one is causing the other, but they do go hand in hand. Um, Insulin resistance, obviously, like we just said, can lead to uh, heart disease, including heart attacks, uh, various forms of cancers, and diabetes. Um, in this study, uh, done in 19 or published in 1998, uh, basically took three groups of uh, allegedly healthy, non obese uh, adults, and they followed them over five years. And they found out that the group that had the most sensitivity to insulin essentially did not develop cardiovascular disease or hypertension. Now, the group that had the most insulin resistance had a high rate of development of cardiovascular disease and hypertension. So there is an association. Now, in this mathematical study, it looked at different risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and they figured out that, you know, insulin resistance is uh, probably the most common cause of cardiovascular disease 80, 40, for 42% of the young adults. You know, and other risk factors such as elevated systolic blood pressure or um, low high density low lipoprotein or elevated BMI are often associated uh, with insulin resistance. Now, not, you know, you don't have to have a big gut in order to perhaps have insulin resistance or, you know, its sister, you know, high visceral fat, you know, abdominal fat. Uh, the, and these two MRIs of uh, physicians that I personally know with a 31-inch uh, waist, uh, the one on the left, had, he was on a low-carbohydrate diet, no processed foods, no polyunsaturated fatty acids or, or so-called vegetable oils, which is a misnomer, by the way. And then the one on the right had a you know kind of more typical diet, but that was high in rice. And as you can see on the left, all the dark areas is basically muscle and the organs. Uh, on the right, really, there's a lot of the white area inside the abdomen. And this is all the visceral fat, which is very inflammatory. Uh, this other study uh, on performing on healthy individuals showed just how the sugar, the glucose level spikes, as well as the insulin spikes after getting diets of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Um, this is one of the reasons why I do have an interest in this as well. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, recent, uh, recently published in this year, a uh, study showing that uh, high levels of insulin can actually uh, make worse inflammation on the fibroblast-like synoviocytes. These are the cells and the joints 
you know, in the knee, on the hips, and other joints that make the fluid in your joints. Um, glucose levels uh, have also been correlated with uh, the risk of uh, dementia as well. Um, even in persons who are not diabetic. Uh, the implications on the COVID-19 uh, are pretty uh, eye-opening. Uh, so, you know, approximately 90% of patients uh, admitted on this particular uh, study uh, show at least one form of uh, comorbidity, such as hypertension, diabetes, chronic lung disease, and so forth. On the other hand, uh, when they were uh, looking at uh, Navy sailors on the USS Roosevelt uh, that had an outbreak of uh, the COVID-19 virus, uh, they found out that roughly about 60% of the carrier's infected sailors really didn't have symptoms, you know, because they're younger and healthier. Um, so just a quick brief uh, on these uh, micronutrients, or basically four micronutrients, uh, it's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Uh, they each give you a certain amount of calories. The, fat, the fats obviously give you more calories per gram than the calories and the, and the uh, proteins. Um, but, you know, of these, only the proteins and the fats are um, necessary nu nutrients. Uh, at least, you know, nine essential amino acids. There are two essential fatty acids, but there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Okay, and, uh, and although the red blood cells do require... Uh, glucose to function, your body makes glucose via a process called gluconeogenesis. Um, at the hospital level, the problem has to do with, with the diets, particularly the diets that diabetic patients get. Uh, widely used in the United States is a, a diet called consistent carbohydrate diet. Uh, this was developed by Dr. Charles Reed in 1951. He was a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of Iowa. And uh, this diet was mainly, mainly primarily formulated for children with type 1 diabetes, okay? Now, the theory was is to provide a consistent amount of carbohydrates so that you know how much uh, medication to give to the patient so you can kind of keep the, the, their sugar in a, in a steady state. Well, but in practice, at least it doesn't really work well for type 2 diabetics. Uh, we're consistently given them that which the patient doesn't eat, which is basically the sugar. Uh, which then requires medications, and it doesn't even address the issue of insulin resistance. So the problem with this is that you end up basically just chasing your tail the whole time, trying to chase those glucose numbers uh, to try to get them and in a con uh, to a controlled state. Uh, and then the root cause for at the, at the hospital level, but also for other uh, locations, is really our dietary guidelines. Our dietary guidelines uh, just uh, call for 45 to 60 percent, 65 percent of the calories coming from carbs, which I personally consider that's just way too high. And then they also want the diets to be low in saturated fats. So saturated fats are the fats that come from animals mainly. And uh, and as a result, uh, you know, if the if the diet needs to be on low in saturated fats, then they get substituted with polyunsaturated fatty acids, which you are usually your your vegetable oils, although that is a misnomer, okay, they're not really vegetables, they're coming from seeds and they're very highly processed. Uh, they use the things such as hexane to process them. Uh, you know, it's not easy to get oil out of corn and some other products. So it's a very industrialized process. It's certainly not something that we want to eat. Uh, in addition, that they're easily, they're, they're very easily um, changed. Uh, they oxidize easily. Uh, they're very unstable. So, at least in the United States, you know, these guidelines affect the, the menus at hospitals, schools, long-term institutions, and prisons. Um, now, the, the, here's the biggest lesson that I have learned since I graduated from medical school uh, in medicine, in all of medicine. Uh, when I graduated from medical school, basically I learned that, you know, diabetes was treatable and you can manage it. And that's still the paradigm for many people. They, they think, well, we got to be able to manage your diabetes or, you know, uh, we got to be trying to keep those numbers under control. Uh, and then the question being, well, why do people get diabetes? Well, you know, it could run in the family. Uh, now, there could be a genetic predisposition. I'm not denying that. Uh, but it's really not something that just runs in the family. Prim primarily, the root cause is diet. Uh, 
But, you know, we, I thought that perhaps if, if somebody gets diabetes, then the treatment, you know, initially will be dietary changes. But if the diabetes is severe, then you have to use medications, uh, starting with oral hypoglycemic medications, and then you use insulin for rescue. Okay. The new paradigm is very different from that. The new paradigm is that type 2 diabetes is a preventable disease. It's a reversible disease. You may not be able to reverse the end organ damage, but you can reverse disease, the disease. And you can place it in remission and keep it there. Um, it's not long, no longer anymore like, well, you know, the sugars are, high, are too high. We just need to start using medication. No, you got to look at the diet. Um, so a low, so-called low-carbohydrate diet, really, it's, there's no set criteria for it. Uh, the USDA recommendations for a diet, like we said, is 45 to 60 parts, uh, 65 percent of the calories coming from carbs, which a low carbohydrate will be much lower than that. Now, there are different variations of this. You can do a ketogenic diet. Uh, for that, you basically will have to go to maybe about 20 grams of carbohydrates a day or less. And that's just basically exhausting your glucose and your glycogen. So now uh, your body is, uh, convert, uh, is using ketones as a source of uh, energy. Um, now there are certain myths about low carbohydrate uh, diets out there that I just want to address. So, you know, the, the guidelines do not support the intake of saturated fat. Uh, uh, now this is a, the being books written on this. Um, but suffice to say that the best data available really shows that actually saturated fats are much better than the polyunsaturated fats. In other words, animal fat such as lard or butter or ghee or tallow, beef tallow, are better than using, you know, sunflower oil, soybean oil, canola oil, and corn oil, and, and all those other vegetable oils. Um, but, you know, our guidelines, they say, oh, we don't support saturated fats. And they're basically trying to reach conclusions from, from studies that have a lot of confounding variables. I'll, I'll address that in my next slide. Uh, they may say that studies show that low carbohydrate diets don't work. That is not true. There's plenty of evidence that to show that works. And this is only a very small example. Um, at least up until 2017, there were at least over 70 studies out there and even more have been published since then uh, showing the effects of a low carbohydrate diet. Um, there are other objections that say that it's a, it's a recent fat diet, which is really nonsense because uh, I would say that the standard American diet has, it's a fat, is the fat diet because it's full of processed foods and, uh, um, you know, processed uh, vegetable oils and uh, very high in sugar. Uh, you know, back in the old days, they were eating, not, not, they were not eating that food. You know, different civilizations were eating what they hunted, what they gathered, or in the early ages of, uh, of the agricultural revolution, uh, they were not really eating the food that, that we eat today. Uh, you know, fruit was seasonal, was not year round. Um, and the killer is, is that they say, well, studies show that the mortality risk uh, is lower with a plant-based diet than with animal-based diet. Well, that's true, but you know, the details is where, the truth is it's truly on the details though. Okay, so these epidemiological studies were just poorly done basically asking people what they eat uh, and eating a carnivore diet uh, up until like maybe two years ago was not even a thing. And so anybody who was had a animal based diet or so-called so carnivore diet was just really eating whatever was in front of them. So they will say, yeah, I eat burgers. Yeah, well, you know, the beef patty comes with the bun, which comes with all the wheat, which comes with the sugar and the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And it comes with the ketchup, which is full of sugar. And then it comes with a processed uh, American cheese slice, which is not really cheese. Uh, then it comes with the French fries, just a load of carbohydrates fried again in, in vegetable oil. And then it comes with a big, you know, cup of, uh, of, of sugary soda. And so you really can't reach conclusions about that. Yeah, absolutely. If you're eating clean on a vegetable uh, based diet or plant-based diet yeah you 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 do better than somebody who's eating all that junk food but don't blame the meat for that i mean you should be blaming all these other things and so these studies have very poor epidemiological data uh, even back then when those studies were done you know 
people were eating a lot of trans fatty acids, which now have been banned. And, you know, eating candies, crackers, and so, and so forth. Uh, so in the case of saturated fatty acids versus polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, there have been actually uh, at least two randomized controlled trials. Uh, actually, there, I think there are three actually out there. But, um, but these two here basically show that uh, against the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the saturated fats um, decrease, have a lower incidence of uh, mortality. So the polyunsaturated fatty acids may drop cholesterol on this first study, uh, but that drop of cholesterol is related to an increased risk of death. So when you go to the supermarket and you see a vegetable oil that it says helps lower cholesterol, yeah, well, it might actually increase your, your risk of death, okay? Um, and this other study is showing 70% and 62% higher rates of cardiovascular disease and death, respectively, from all causes when compared to polyunsaturated fats uh, versus uh, saturated fats. And these, these studies were randomized, okay? When you do a epidemiological study, all you can really conclude is association. But you can't really uh, conclude causation on an epidemiological study. You have to do something such as a randomized controlled trial, which these are. Uh, so here's the benefits of low-carb uh, low diet. Uh, these are uh, MRI scans uh, with a little bit of color in there, just for clarity. It was a 68-year-old man uh, who stopped eating processed foods and carbs for 35 weeks. He did not do one minute of exercise. And uh, on the bottom right, you see all that visceral fat that he lost. He not only lost the uh, subcutaneous fat, but he also lost the visceral fat as well which is in the red. Um, this is a 58 year old man with uh, left middle cerebral artery occlusion, completely occluded. And by uh, going into a low carbohydrate diet with no processed foods um, and fasting, that artery opened up. No medication on this, no catheterization, nothing like that. Just dietary changes and lifestyle changes. Um, Ketogenic diet can also help in the remission of psychotic symptoms. Uh, this is something also is being looked at. So where to start from here? Um, the low carbohydrate diet in the ICU setting. So this was a study that was randomized, double blinded, where they gave um, low carb uh, feeds uh, versus a high carb feeds, and the patients who had the low carb feeds were able to wean them uh, uh, 62 hours earlier than the uh, than the control uh, group, and they also had a lower partial pressure of carbon dioxide at the time when they started weaning. Uh, in the pediatric setting, uh, they, this could be used in the pediatric setting, this study uh, showed, uh, uh, performed by Dr. Uh, Robert Lustig and his group. Uh, they basically had isocaloric uh, feeds uh, or food to the patient, diet to the patient, but one of them was decreased in fructose. And of course, that will involve fruits, table sugars such as sucrose, including that will increase uh, uh, sodas, uh, Etc. And in a span of ten days, only in ten days, they showed that they already lowered the lower. They had lower diastolic blood pressure, lower lactate levels, and improved insulin uh, parameters such as glucose tolerance. And they had more weight reduction. And then in the group that had a, a higher fructose uh, content. Uh, now this is in children, and adolescents. But you know, imagine the possibilities of this when you try to fix the diet. You change the diet to fix the health of patients, particularly patients in nursing homes, okay? Uh, you know, everybody's concerned with corona, uh, coronavirus. You know, you know, is it a matter of time that everybody will get it? Will there be a vaccine available before that happens? You know, it could be a long time, but if you can get patients starting a low carbohydrate diet, avoiding the processed foods, uh, you can improve their health parameters such that, that if or when they get infected, they're in a much better position to be able to fight the infection. Uh, low carbohydrate diet in pregnancy, okay. Uh, this is probably the first study looking at uh, the protein requirement for women who are pregnant. And from the point that they're 16, uh, 16 weeks into the gestation, they already have a, a higher requirement for the rest of the pregnancy than, the, than non-pregnant women. And you know, common deficiencies of the prenatal vitamins usually include uh, micronutrients that you'll be finding in the animal foods. Um, this other study also showed that the women who were in a low-carbohydrate diet 
uh, have a lower have infants with a lower uh, rate of obesity. Um, so what do we do at the hospital level? Uh, you know, the, the, my 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 suggestion, my plan will be to uh, update the menus and educate all patients to include a low carbohydrate diet, uh, and any at every level of the hospital stay. Um, you know, there are some sometimes regulations that may get in the way, uh, but you educate the patient. You know, um, and if even if perhaps the tray comes with something that they shouldn't be having, you, you can tell them about it. Uh, tra- drastically reduce the carbohydrates in their in their uh, in their in their food trays, and that includes eliminating fruit juice, mashed potatoes, toast, uh, oatmeal, and rolls, and probably substitute with putting uh, scrambled eggs and bacon, uh, and probably maybe some uh, berries, which will uh, would which tend not to spike sugar like other fruits. And then also include fermented foods without added sugars. A lot of the yogurts out there have a lot of sugar on them, but it's important to use one that don't have added sugar. And this helps improve the microbiome, especially those people who really need that, such as patients with inflammatory bowel disease or history of seed difficile colitis. Uh, so in summary, you know, chronic disease is not just treatable, but it's preventable, reversible, and can be placed in remission. So, and the goal here is to uh, reverse insulin resistance. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.